This is El Hay, a subarctic beekeeper, one of the many, living on Happy Creek Farm, which is a little bit north of Fairbanks, Alaska. And in this podcast, I interviewed a longtime subarctic beekeeper named Stephen George. Stephen is very, very knowledgeable and has been overwintering his honeybees for many years with very, very good success. I wanted to interview him because I wanted to get some of his knowledge out to you guys who may be interested in beekeeping in the far north. Up here in Alaska, there is a fallacy that it's impossible to overwinter honeybees and that people should kill their bees after the honey harvest. This is wrong, it's incorrect. It's still perpetuated for some reason. People have been wintering their honeybees up here for generations. And one of my goals is to educate people on how to do this and to prevent people from killing their bees after the honey harvest. So this is part one of an interview with Stephen George and I hope you enjoy it. Stephen has been keeping bees in north of Fairbanks, Alaska for how many years? Uh, since 2000. Since so 25 years? Close 23 to tw- years. 23 years. Yeah. I'm going to push the microphone over to him. We're at a coffee shop. <laughs> Probably a bad idea <laughs> because they're grinding coffee, but I'm going to try to pump him for all the information I can get out of him on wintering bees in our environment and our climate. So I apologize for the background noise. How did you start beekeeping? I started actually in Pennsylvania, where I'm from, south of Pittsburgh. At the age of 14, there was a job or somebody mowing grass, and it happened to be a master beekeeper that owned Sunstream Farms, and he sold honeybees. After being there for a couple weeks, he put me in a bee suit, and went from there, and he gave me a bunch of bees to start my own beehive and fell in love with it. So did he mentor you? Yes, he told me how to make your own queens. And And when did you move up to Alaska? Came up to Alaska in 1984. My daughter knew that I raised bees the whole time and she kept saying, Dad, Dad, get some honeybees, get some honeybees after we bought our house in 2000. I was kind of reluctant at first, then I started um, raising a couple hives and it led to having 25, 30 hives. As it does. (laughs) Yeah, it kind of grew on me. But there was a lot of challenges and a lot of trial and error that I had to uh, overcome up here. Like what? Uh, The first one was the strain of bees. I was used to raising Italian and some hybrid starlight honeybees which are older uh, honeybees that people have crossed. And I started researching different countries like Norway and Sweden and Northern Russia, what type of honeybees they have. And then I came to the conclusion that the Carniolans and the Russians were the best suited bees for up here. And I tried the Russians, didn't care for them that much. I don't either. The temperament, I don't care what people say, they have a, a bad temper. And then uh, did regular New World Carniolans. They were okay, but they had a hard time making it through the winter up here. Do you know why? Why? Yeah, why they had a hard time? Um, Because the New World Carniolans are actually a mix of Carniolan, Caucasian, and Italian. They're from the United States. The Old World Carniolans are from Slovakia, uh, those countries. And they're used to a cold climate and damp climate. Our winters are up here are cold and the summers are damp. Yeah. <laughs> and I noticed the difference between them when I was, I had some Caucasians, I had some Italians, I had some Russians. One thing I noticed about the old world Carniolans was even in the rain at 50 degrees, they were flying and collecting. Yeah, people don't believe me when I say that. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. You, you sit out there and it'd be drizzling, you're cold. And these bees are working their little butts off going in and out. You say, how can they do that? But it all goes to the breed. That's the first thing I found out out there. The second one was I tried to overwinter outside and the losses were just too high. So I started doing some research. And I can say my mentor was um, the Canadian beekeeper. But he's relatively new. Well, he's kind of new, but he's got it down to a perfection. Ian Stepler. But they have long winners and everything and he found out to minimize his losses put them indoors yeah. and then I found out that in Minnesota North Dakota mm-hmm. they're doing the same thing and that's where I said you know what let me try wintering them indoors and I did and it turned out to be great 
as long as you keep the temperature right for them. It's got to be like 45, 46 degrees, 5 Celsius. 45 or 46 degrees yeah. Fahrenheit. 5 Celsius is the perfect. Very interesting, because when you were advising me on my bee barn, <laughs> you told me between 40 and 42. Yeah. Now, so see, this is an important thing. That's because trial and error. I know, trial and error. And there's I, always new information. The information on how we do it up here, there's no research on it. Right. There is in other countries. So when you wintered them outdoors, what did you do? I wintered them outdoors. Wooden I, hives, right? Wooden hives, but I put two inch high density foam insulation around them. I also took a little pad heaters, electric pad heaters in the spring and in the fall, and I put them on aluminum mm -hmm. so that the aluminum would dissipate all the heat out. So like oil pan heater we put yeah, on the Yeah, but smaller. Right? Only like a 10 watt, 5 watt heater. I stuck it right in there and what happens, the heat goes up. In where? In Into the entrance. Oh, into the entrance. Into the very entrance. Yeah, into the entrance. I thought you were putting them on the back. I was putting them on the back and then I figured out that putting them in the entrance was a lot better. So this beekeepers who are listening to this podcast is why you want to keep in touch with your other fellow beekeepers <laughs> because things change. So now you're putting them in the entrance. I remember a post on one of our forums from a woman from Finland she posted a picture of her hives and I could see a plug coming out the back and I asked her about it and she said that they slide heaters in the back of an open bottom board. Right. And I was like, aha, so yeah. we're not the only ones. Yeah. So now you put them right in the front. Because I have that slotted board just at right distance from the bees that they don't go on there and get too hot or anything. So you've got your bottom board and you're using wooden bottom boards. Wooden bottom board. Uh, open or closed? So closed bottom. I've never used open up here. So you've got a closed wooden bottom board and then you built a two inch laded rack, yeah. which is many of us have done over the last couple of years. I went to one inch because I, I did some one inch, some two inch because I was using scrap lumber and I realized it didn't make a difference. But it, it probably does with you sticking the heater right in the front. Right. I, I ordered one off of Man Lake, and then I just copied it off. But that makes a big difference up here for two reasons. One is for heating the hive, and two is for overcrowding. Because when they get overcrowded in the summer, they have a tendency to want to swarm. Mm -hmm. That gives all the worker bees a place to congregate after they're done working in the evening. This later rack does. Right. So are you telling me that you are putting heaters in your hive when you wintered outdoors? When I wintered outdoors, and now I don't do that anymore because I winter indoors, so I put them in the spring. I can take them out in March. Yes. Put those little heaters under there. That way they can do a cleansing flight when it gets warm. And at night, we're really cold, down in the zero at night in March. Um, that helped the bees, and plus it stimulates, that heat stimulates the queen to start laying earlier so that you don't have a weak hive. So you're doing outdoors first, and with the two-inch foam around, mm -hmm. which is what many people up here do right. with wooden hives if they're doing them outdoors and sealing the seams and such. One entrance at the bottom, no top entrance, because then you get the chimney effect, and then you right. get the warm air for leaving. Were you putting heaters in the hive when you were wintering them outdoors? Yes. You sneaky beekeeper, you. <laughs> so you would turn on... I was experimenting with yes, it. <laughs> yes, but you've had, I mean, you've had massively great success. When we've talked, you've known exactly what was going on with everybody. Because well, I, I bought one of your old world carny queens. Yeah, that, the reason I did that was because I kept a journal mm -hmm. on each hive. Mm -hmm. each and each hive. Yeah, and every couple weeks when I'd go into it and check it, I'd write, is the queen laying eggs? Is it still the same queen? What I wanted to do was develop a queen from the old Carniolans that would do really, really good up here. After about 10 years, it started paying off. I noticed that they were surviving better than the bees that you buy. They come up from California. So when would you turn the heaters on during the winter when you had them outside? Um, or would you run them I had winter? a thermostat on them. On each individual hive? Um, no, well, it was one thermostat, but it went by the outside temperature. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it wasn't a digital one, it was an old hand one mm -hmm. that you crank up or crank down and you set it on what temperature you want. And any time it got below a certain temperature, they'd come on. And that was mostly in the evenings. And what temp? Um, I think I had it set at like 30. 30 below zero? No, 30 degrees. Oh, any time the temperature, our winter temperature got below 30 degrees Fahrenheit? Yeah, it would come on. on. 
That's nothing. Anytime the temperature got to 30 degrees Fahrenheit, you would turn the heat it on. It would automatically put, put some heat out to the high. So you would have your heater on at 26 below zero, your yeah. heater's on. Yeah. And because it's wood, it wouldn't damage the wood. And the aluminum, the low wattage heater, mm -hmm. wood was on the aluminum, dispersed the heat. Right. So you wouldn't want to do this with polystyrene. No. Because then you'd have a melted mess. Yeah, there is a way you could probably do it. If you put one side of the uh, aluminum, if you glued wood to it as a buffer, and then, yeah, that would probably work. But at first I tried putting it on the outside of the hive in between the insulation and the box. And one time, just by chance, I said, you know, I don't feel like unscrewing this and putting these on here. So I just slid it in there and it worked out perfect. It's weird how sometimes when we just like are like, well, whatever, and yeah. then it's, we hit the jackpot. Yeah. How many years did you do that? I did that for like four or five years. That's when I started putting them inside. First year I put them inside, I had a 100% success. And then the second year, I lost some hives. And that's about when Varola started taking them. And then I started putting two and two together, and I said, you know what? I need to start treating my hives for Nosema and Varola mites because the Varola carries the viruses that kills the bees, right. and that's what's causing colony collapse disorder, they're finding out. It's weakening, it weakens our bees. It, it wakes them, weakens them up, and then the Nozema, what it does is they, they can't hold it for that six months. Their fecal matter. Right. And we have the longest period of time that bees have to hold it. Even So our bees cannot defecate for over sometimes over six, six months. Six months, and six months is pushing the limit as far as them not defecating. Last year, the year before, I had bee anxiety. I was, you know, it's March, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, it's getting warmer. Do I take them out? And I took them out, put them on my deck in the sun, talked to you a couple times, you know? Yeah, that's exactly what I, I came to the conclusion that in March, we'll have days where it'll fluctuate up to 45. Right. 50 degrees right. and then in the sun it's even warmer right so the bees can fly mm -hmm. so that's why i take them out and i put the heater in there just for night so that they can go out and do a cleansing flight because if they don't then they start start having what they call blowouts yeah <laughs> and they're not very fun <laughs> they're messy when you had your outside what kind of losses were you having when i had them outside i was losing probably 75 percent or above and so how many hives did you have then uh, I think 10, 15. So. so that impacted obviously what you would come out with in the yeah, spring. Yeah, I ended up having to buy more bees for honey production. Was this before or after you started experimenting with queens? Um, this was about the same time. When you decided to winter them indoors, can you explain what you did to your chicken coop? First thing I did was I called my kids over, <laughs> since they're a lot younger than me, and we did a, a real good insulation. The floor, I added some two inch high density foam and then put plywood on top of it. And then the walls, I, they were already eight inch walls. I increased them to 12 inch walls with insulation. And in, in thickness. In thickness for insulation. And then the ceiling, I put like almost three feet of insulation. And that made it to the point where as, as long as the door's insulated and well sealed, I never needed any heat. Only time the heater would come on is when I opened the door and it would come on and would go off. But then I ran into the problem where I, when I started out, I found out that the bees were making too much heat and it was getting too hot in there. And that's where I put a ventilation system in it kept it at a steady temperature. I have a digital readout now. I don't know if, I, I don't think I have ever showed it. I changed it over a couple years ago, digital, where it controls both the heat and the cooling and keeps it just right at the exact temperature. What did you use for insulation? You used two inch foam, we talked about that. Well, it was originally a chicken coop, so the walls had uh, fiberglass insulation. Mm -hmm. And then I spray foam the inside to add the, the uh, other inches to it. That's on the walls? Yes. What did you use for the ceiling? The ceiling is, um, it's fiberglass insulation. Two and a half feet, to maybe three feet of insulation. Was, was that what you had originally in your chicken coop? Yes. So you didn't have to add much? No, I didn't have to add any, uh, any of the fiberglass insulation. 
Only, the only thing I had to change was the floor because I could feel the floor in the wintertime when the chickens were in there, it would always freeze. Yeah. And so I got to do something about that. So I ins insulated the floor and then I beefed up the walls with insulation because I didn't want to have to pay a high electric bill to heat the place. So when I looked inside there, I started taking pictures. There were pipes going in, pipes going out, ventilation system. Yeah. So then when it got too hot, cold air is brought in. When it gets too cold, heat goes on. Do you also have a thing to remove excess carbon dioxide or not? I do. I stuck a, a small three inch system in and it goes off of a timer. Depending on how many hives I have in there, and that's to keep the CO2 down because that will, the bees will die unless you do that. It kicks on 10 minutes every couple hours and I have it so it sucks from the bottom because CO2 goes down. And then when that sucks in cool, cool air from the inside, it automatically causes circulation where it has to push that air somewhere. So I, I have another system that just lets the air out. Let me get to the easy stuff first. When I last visited you, I think you had 30 hives. Mm -hmm. And you could fit all of them inside your chicken coop. Right. That we will now call a bee barn. <laughs> okay. And so you were able to get all 30 in there. You had them all down to one deep box. Yeah, I found up here, one of the things I found about keeping bees, you don't need two brood boxes. A queen, our, our summers are so short that she cannot physically produce enough eggs to fill up more than one brood box okay when i started out i was using two and i noticed that the eggs were kind of in the middle in like an oval mm -hmm. thing she would lay some in the top some in the bottom okay and when then you had the two boxes when i had the two boxes but the rest of it she wouldn't lay in I said let me try one box and i tried one box and she filled it up it was and what time of year did she fill it up what time, she filled it up probably about mid-June. Okay. It was completely full, and that's when her honey flow starts really good, mm -hmm. about mid-June. So it worked out perfectly. Um, now, sometimes I kind of cheat. Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> what I do is I will have the one brew box, and I'll put that out. And if she fills that up, mm -hmm. then I will not use a queen excluder and I'll just put honey supers on it, and she'll go up there and start laying eggs in the honey supers, okay? Drawback is she, you can have larvae mixed with your honey. So around the end of July, I'll push her down into the bottom box and put a queen excluder to force her only to lay down there, and the bees will backfill the uh, cells that have brood in it with honey. They'll clean it out real good, and then they'll backfill it. And that way you have a bigger, robust hive if you have a good honey flow during July, the beginning of August. So when you are preparing, when you're thinking about winter, overwintering your bees, and I know many people up here don't do it uh, because there's been this long accepted rumor that it's impossible and it's not been, hasn't been ever, there's been people been doing it for generations, but people didn't talk. Well, some people talked and then some people discouraged it. We're going to end that interview right there and leave you hanging. Sorry, but as always, this podcast is copyrighted and all rights are reserved. Take care of yourselves, take care of your bees, and Slava Ukraina.